she says, I am also utterly disappointed that you would honor him alongside a person who has been responsible for many human rights violations and should be put on trial, not honored. The man that is supposed to be honored tomorrow actually signed the agreement between Israel and South Africa. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 22 cable stations from Vermont to New York City. On the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Last month, there was a small victory in Connecticut when a leader of an apartheid state was shunned at a major human rights conference. Incredibly, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization at the University of Connecticut was honoring five people for their human rights leadership, and one of them was Shimon Peres, the President of Israel, a man who for decades has been in the forefront of injustice and outright crimes. A number of professors were alerted to this by PACB, the Palestine Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. After they contacted the other honorees, they all pulled out. The story was picked up by the Hartford Current and internationally by the Associated Press. To let students and professors at UConn know about Perez, we held a forum the day before the honor was to be presented to his son-in-law, Raphael Walden. Our show today is about the forum and features two speakers, myself and historian Lenny Brenner. We're holding this forum in protest of the decision of UNESCO at UConn to honor Israeli President Shimon Peres. However, we want to make it clear that in no way do we want to criticize the other honorees and the Legacies of Human Rights Leadership and Struggles Conference. The concept of human rights is one of mankind's noblest ideas, and it is a great thing to honor those who struggle for it. We just believe UNESCO made a huge mistake with Shimon Peres. We know now that at least two of the honorees have withdrawn from the conference. Ms. Mariam al kaawaja who was to speak about her imprisoned father, Abdul Hadi al kaawaja and Sherbanu Tasir, who was to speak about the life of Salman Satir, have withdrawn. Mariam al kaawaja gave her reason for withdrawing in a letter to UNESCO. I'll just read one sentence. She says, I am also utterly disappointed that you would honor him alongside a person who has been responsible for many human rights violations and should be put on trial, not honored. And uh, we have a flyer there, a double-sided flyer with her full letter, along with an elaborate list of his offenses that she included. I do want to take a minute to talk about the work of Al Ka'awaja and Tasir. For those who do not know, Bahrain is a monarchy where a Sunni king rules with an iron fist over a, a largely Shia population. He is supported by Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Fifth Fleet. His response to the Arab Spring was repression and even the bulldozing of Shia mosques. Mariam al Kawaja al wrote this about her father. He's a firm believer in the struggle for human rights no matter what the cost may be, and thus endured a 110-day hunger strike to shed light on the human rights situation in Bahrain. He has dedicated his life to working on many issues, whether it was migrant worker rights, women's rights, rights of the unemployed, those in dire need of adequate housing, political prisoners, and the list goes on. He served internationally working as the regional protection coordinator for the Middle East and North African region for frontline defenders, training and working with human rights defenders from the Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia and beyond. Al Ka'awaja is 52 years old and has been sentenced to life in prison. 
Salman Tassir was a businessman and a member of the Pakistan People's Party and became governor of Punjab. A bit of context. Pakistan is a country where the U.S. has encouraged extremism for decades as a counterweight to the left. And extremism, extremism has flowered. In 2010, a Christian woman named Asya Bibi was convicted of violating Pakistan's severe blasphemy law and sentenced to death. Salman Tassir very bravely said publicly that the woman was innocent and criticized the blasphemy law itself. In 2011, Tassir was murdered by one of his bodyguards. So in the case of these two men, the honors are well deserved, as are laurels for the legendary Kwame Nkrumah and the friend of Malcolm X, Yuri Koshiyama. Shimon Peres does not deserve honors. Lenny Brenner is a historian most known for his Zionism in the age of the dictators. And he's a frequent guest on our program. At his talk at Yukon, he concentrated on Shimon Peres' close support for apartheid South Africa and read from the recent book, The Unspoken Alliance by Sasha Polakow Saransky. I'm here to dump on uh, Shimon Peres, and uh, who is the, no, nothing less than the president of the state of Israel. And what I found when I was looking through the book, Mr. Israeli government in one position or another for decades. Uh, he's been prime minister, foreign minister, defense minister, I think, uh, uh, I mean, just on and on. And, and uh, one after the other after the other. Now, with regards to the apartheid uh, regime, uh, Polakov Sharansky uh, starts off, I'm going to read a few, just a few quotes because it's, I, I don't really have to go beyond them. They're so, you know, obvious. Uh, he starts off by uh, with, uh, talking about Rabin's labor government, which ruled uh, the country from 1974 to 1977, did not share the ethnic nationalist ideology of South Africa's rulers, but Israel's war-battered industries desperately needed export markets and the possibility of lucrative trade with South Africa was hard for Defense Minister Shimon Peres to resist. As Rabin, Peres and a new generation of leaders inherited the party from David Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir that compromising certain values was necessary for survival gained sway and socialist idealism gave way to real politics. Okay, so right off the bat, page seven, he's already telling you, you know, this guy has, you know, comes with a, with a knapsack full of socialist Zionist ideals and forget about it, just toss them right in the wastebasket. Um, he then goes on, indeed much of Israel's top brass and Likud party leadership felt an affinity with South Africa's white government and unlike Perez and Rabin, they did not feel a need to publicly denounce apartheid while secretly supporting Pretoria. Now, that's not only telling you, once again, uh, don't believe a word that comes out of Shimon Peres's mouth, but what it also is saying is that the present Likud party government of Netanyahu was openly for the government of South Africa, the apartheid government of South Africa. Now, some of you, I can see, are, are young and you might not be familiar with the apartheid uh, regime, the whole history of it and so on, in that period, let's say when they made the deal in the, in the mid-70s, apartheid South Africa was the most racist government on the planet Earth, beyond dispute. A black in South Africa had about as much rights as a mouse in your walls. That's about it. I mean, they were the overwhelming majority of the country. They had no rights. 
where to live, where to work, the, the vote was unthinkable, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Perez's role in forming this alliance was right up front, okay? In November 1974, Shimon Peres came to Pretoria, that's the uh, capital of the uh, South Africa, to meet secretly with South African leaders. After the trip, he wrote to his hosts thanking them for helping establish a, quote, vitally important, end quote, link between the two governments. Peres, who routinely denounced the apartheid in, in public, went on to stress that, quote, this cooperation is based not only on common interests and the determination to resist equally our enemies, but also on the unshakable foundation of our common hatred of injustice and our refusal to submit to it. Now, I didn't make that up, and Pol Polakov Sharansky didn't make it up. The man who is actually making the deal with apartheid South Africa never publicly stops denouncing it and privately never stops publicly praising it, okay? Uh, he met in, uh, with South African defense leader P.W. Botha the following year in Switzerland. And it was there that the two ministers laid the foundation for an enduring military relationship. They also signed the original Israel-South Africa agreement. So the man that is supposed to be honored tomorrow actually signed the agreement between Israel and South Africa, okay? Now, understand what the situation was. Israel had stolen some plans from uh, uh, France for making a bomb and uh, got a little here and there from uh, fr benevolent friends in the American government, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the problems that it had was that you have to make an atom bomb out of something, out of uranium. And South Africa is just one giant mine of uranium and a million and one other uh, uh, minerals. So the arrangement was they shipped the, the uh, uranium to South Africa in return for which so, uh, Israel sometimes shipped bombs to South Africa and all the time helped the South African apartheid regime produce at atomic bombs. I mean, that's how severe it is. Now, understand, obviously, an arrangement like that has a, a lot of military secrets, but it wasn't a secret thing. It was going on in broad daylight this is a photograph from 1975 of the South Africa propaganda chief, is the Israeli uh, prime minister, the South African intelligence head, and Shimon Peres, okay? And uh, at one point they even brought the prime minister of South Africa to the Wailing Wall, which is the Orthodox Jewish shrine in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he went there. Every crook and knave uh, that has anything to do with uh, uh, Israel uh, goes to the Wailing Wall. Uh, R. Obama, R. Romney, the South African uh, Prime Minister, they always show up to get photographed uh, praying to God. Okay. Now, uh, it reached the point, I mean, to show you how close the arrangement was, Israel, Israel's offer of nuclear missiles, codenamed Shalit, came up again two months later. This is in, in uh, 77, when on June 4th, when Perez and Botha held a second meeting in Zurich. Now the discussion turned to warheads. Minutes from the June meeting revealed that Botha expressed interest in buying the Jerichos, that's the name of the uh, missile, if they came with, quote, the correct warhead, and that, quote, Minister Perez said that the correct payroll was available in three sizes. Okay? I mean, 
think about it for a minute. We're talking about at atomic weapon deals organized, systematically organized by the man that tomorrow is going to be honored in this university. I mean, go figure. And uh, understand, all during this time, Perez never stops denouncing apartheid in broad daylight. Uh, on a plane trip to Cameroon, which is one of the countries in Africa, Perez openly criticized South Africa. On the ground, he told Mr. Bia, quote, a Jew who accepts apartheid ceases to be a Jew. A Jew and racism do not go together. This is the man who is organizing the arrangement with South Africa. And I, I, again, let me see, and I'll end shortly on these rep repetitious quotes, but I'm trying to make a, you know, pound in a point on this. Three minutes. Three minutes. Perez responded with his customary sanctimony telling lawyers, lawmakers that, quote, Israel repudiates any expression of re racism on whatever level. On and on, on and on. Okay, now, what it tells you is don't believe a word that Shimon Peres says today about democracy, liberty, human equality, et cetera, et cetera. This is the same man that was denouncing apartheid while selling weapons to it, okay? Now, the reality is, right now, just, and this is a, very important for the people here in this room to know, Israel has a not-so-secret alliance with Saudi Arabia. They have already, according to the London Times, and I can send the article to anybody that gives me their email, according to uh, the London Times in, in 2010, they wrote a, a very detailed article. Both of them have it in for Iran. Uh, about 10% of uh, Saudi Arabia is Shia, and most of them live along the Persian Gulf, right over the oil. And Saudi Arabia is very concerned that uh, uh, Iran uh, is mobilizing uh, the Shia uh, to get their rights, the right to vote, uh, you know, little things like that, Not, nothing important, you know, just little elementary things like that. And the result is that uh, Saudi Arabia knows that it can't beat Iran on its own, so it has already rehearsed an Israeli flyover to hit uh, Iran. And that, according to the London Times, is with the knowledge and consent of the Obama administration. Now, South Africa never did get those nuclear weapons but they got plenty of conventional weapons from Israel, which they use liberally against the rights and democratic yearnings of not only their own people, but their neighbors. In a little known effort, South Africa fomented a civil war in neighboring Mozambique, which may have cost a million lives. In my own remarks, I talked about just a few of the things that Perez was personally involved with. Shimon Peres was first prime minister from 1984 to 1986. During that time, he authorized the kidnapping and imprisonment of the Israeli whistleblower Mordecai Vanunu. Now, Lenny Brenner has told you about uh, the involvement with South Africa. Just to emphasize, I did a, just a simple Google search. I think I put in the words uh, Shimon Peres nuclear weapons and uh, 1998 New York Times book review came up by Avner Cohn saying three, three men deserve the most credit, to use his word, for the program. That's David Ben-Gurion, David Bergman, and Shimon Peres. Now, these nuclear bombs are made in factories. They're made in Demona in the Negev Desert. And one of the workers there at this factory was Mordecai Vanunu. In the 1980s, he discovered the Palestinian human rights issue and started taking part in demonstrations. 
1985, he left Israel with photos of the Demona bomb factory that he had secretly taken. He converted to Christianity and after discussions in an Australian church, decided to bring the proof of Israel's nuclear bomb program to the attention of the world. To let the world know that a country that had committed aggression many times secretly possessed the worst weapons in the world. He gave his information to the London Sunday Times and just before it was published, he was kidnapped from Italy by Israeli agents and brought back to Israel where he was confined for 18 years, almost all of it in solitary confinement. The nuclear arms race in the Middle East was started by Israel with help from the US and the French. Vanunu tried to stop it with his revelations for this, Shimon Peres had him grabbed and sentenced for treason. Peres also participated as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Vice Premier during the first Palestinian uprising at the end of the 80s, when mass demonstrations and stones and sticks were met with the policy of force, might, and beatings. When captured youths had their arms broken so they couldn't throw anything again when it was illegal for years for Palestinians to go to school at any level. Shimon Peres made no criticism of this. Peres was foreign minister again in 1992 and helped arrange the Oslo Agreement, which earned him a Nobel Peace Prize. In the question and answers, we can talk about this, but I'll just say that the Oslo Agreement was fatally flawed and was not a basis for peace. From 1995 to 96, he was once again prime minister. A bit of context. Israel was in those days occupying South Lebanon. And occupation was started in the bloody invasion of 1982. Military resistance by Lebanese in the 90s led to attack and counterattack. And in 1996, Perez authorized Operation Grapes of Wrath with 1,100 jet bombing attacks and one large massacre of civilians. During the operation on April 18th, Israeli soldiers sh shot 36 artillery shells in and around the well-marked UN compound of Kana, Lebanon, that had been the refuge of 800 Lebanese civilians. Over 100 people were torn to pieces. TV reports showed battle-hardened journalists weeping as they walked among the corpses. No TV news in the world could show the most revealing pictures. Rescuers for a long time didn't know how many people had been killed because the heaps of body parts were all around. A UN soldier with a camcorder recorded five minutes of the shelling and the image of an unmanned Israeli spy plane flying overhead. UN soldiers spotted two helicopters in the area. A UN commander pleaded with the Israelis during the shelling for a halt. The police fell on deaf ears and the gunners continued their slaughter. The UN issued a report on Kana which determined that it was highly unlikely that human or mechanical error caused the deaths. The implication is obvious. The prime minister and man most responsible for grapes of wrath was Shimon Peres. He denied any blame for the deliberate attack on Kana, rejected the UN and Amnesty International reports on the matter, and said, in my opinion, everything was done according to clear logic and a responsible way. I am at peace. For this atrocity alone, Paris should be banned from any consideration for honors, whatever he did later or before in life. Peres has been president of Israel since 2007. He was chief of staff during the ever-increasing siege of Gaza. One report that came out this week so told that Israeli government people were carefully calculating what was the minimum number of calories for Palestinians to survive. In the winter of 2008 and 9, Israel launched another operation Operation Cast Lead. It devastated Gaza, killed 300 children, 29 people in one family, family the Al-Samunis, and a thousand others. 
Finally, let us consider the big picture. Perez is the head of the state of a country of Israel which stretches from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. The peoples there, primarily Israeli Jews and Palestinians, have radically different status and rights. The government says it's a Jewish state and it belongs not to its citizens but to the Jewish people all over the world. Palestinian families who were not pushed out in 48 have the right to vote, but, what, uh, but have what the New York Times once called 10th class citizenship. Over 93% of the land is barred to these citizens. Tens of thousands live in unrecognized village without any government services. Now, there are also the non-citizen Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza. They do not vote. They are surrounded by military bases, Jewish-only settlements, and Jewish-only roads. Gaza, furthermore, is considered an enemy entity under varying degrees of siege by land and air. And as we saw this week with the Swedish ship barred from aid by sea also. Areas where populations have radically different rights are victims of the international crime of apartheid. And Shimon Peres is the highest representative of this 20th century apartheid state. For UNESCO to honor the head of an apartheid state as a paragon of human rights virtue is absurd and grotesque. Upcoming on December 8th, a major civil liberties conference featuring Glenn Greenwald. Go to our website for more details. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. When the world has gone crazy and it's all becoming clear when they're gunning down our comrades and it seems the end is near as they're loading up the launchers for the tear gas grenades we can take off our bandanas and kiss behind the barricades when it's madness all around and you can see this at a glance we will sing and we will cry